Hello and welcome back if you haven't been here before. I'm Milia, also known as Zoots. So I thought that I would just talk a little bit about the five tips that I think have impacted my art the most and made the biggest difference in my own learning. You know that feeling when you either go and take a class or you learn a cool new art tip or skill and it just completely transforms how you see your own art and everything you worked on last week just suddenly looks really bad. <laughs> most of these tips have resulted in that change in myself. Hopefully they do for you too. One thing I did want to mention is that I primarily draw figures and portraits and people, so a lot of my examples are going to be using figures and like humans, but most of these tips are quite fundamental in my regular practice like week over week i find myself going back to work on these fundamental things to further refine my skills so i have a good foundation to build complete paintings off of i will always find myself coming back to these tips i also do want to do a separate video that is just all about finding references how i find references for different types of art that i do whether it's for manipulation or figure drawing and how i use those references so we're not going to be going over references today in this video but if you would be interested in content like that you know be sure to subscribe. Let's get started. Let's go for it. The first most impactful tip that I remember learning in the first figure drawing class that I ever took when I was a teenager was learning about negative space. So negative space, if you haven't heard that term before, if you're not familiar, it refers to um, generally all of the space that is around the figure that you're drawing. So I guess you could say the space within the figure is a positive space and everything else that goes in the background or like fills in the gaps between branches in a tree or between limbs in a figure, that's all negative space. Going by example, the negative space in this figure is like the, I think the, the first one that stood out to me when I picked out this figure for an example was the space in between here, the arm and the stomach and the leg, as well as this triangle in between the legs and this big wonky shape that is in between the arms. Looking at the negative space and the actual shape that that negative space creates will help you to understand how the form fills the space, since we sort of perceive things in a 2D way, especially if you're looking at a 2D reference, but you're always seeking to understand what that 3D shape is in space um, and how it fills it up. So looking at the shape of these spaces in between all of these limbs helps you First of all, understand that form a little bit better, especially in cases where there's pulp shortening. And I'll have some examples of that in a bit, but this negative space can be really wonky and kind of give you a sense of what those shapes are, even though your, you know, your 2D perception of the object shows this very foreshortened thing. But your 3D brain is like, well, that is a long arm. There's no way it can show up as this tiny short thing. Um, so that's something that I've found. I can understand by looking at the negative space, especially if there's like a foreshortened arm coming towards you. And that is the other thing too that negative space can help you with is understanding the placement of objects relative to each other. You know, maybe you're looking at these books or flowers behind me and your brain is kind of thinking of them as far away because they're set behind me, but noticing where there might be overlap between my head and maybe the books behind me will help you understand how all of these objects fill in the 3D space relative to each other. And not only that, but the negative space is not just like within the figure between objects, but also outside of the figure. So looking at the angle between the hand and this leg and the other leg for one, of course, between the leg and the foot above and below, and then maybe the, the shape that is around the head relative to the arm and how much of the shoulder you can see here. These, these are all shapes too. These are shapes that you can look at to help you understand how this form is taking up space in a 3D sense. And it's, it's always something that has been immensely, immensely helpful for me is to just look at everything that is going on around the figure and figure out um, how those objects all sort of interact with each other, um, I guess energetically in terms of how you're building up the form um, and creating those shapes. So I found a fun second example too that I wanted to pull up. So this I thought had some really good examples. First, this tiny one within the form as well as this big wonky one between this leg, this other arm, and the chest. You can also look at the shapes like relative to the floor, which I didn't really draw, but you can imagine is in here. Originally when I drew this, there is actually a certain amount of foreshortening happening on this shin that is going into the background. And I actually had this angle a little bit off, and instead I had this shin going back behind this leg a little bit more. 
but when I looked at this object, I realized that this shape was really only between the ankle, just a tiny bit, and the foot and the ground, and I had to bring this angle a lot more back behind the image. So that was something that helped me figure out the placement of this leg a little bit better. And then the other important thing that I was looking at was understanding this shape here when I was kind of trying to figure out where the weight of this figure was going. And so there's an angle that goes a little bit more um, in towards where this person has all of their weight on that knee and that foot. There's also, of course, this shape here between the body and the arm that um, I was looking at to help me understand the, the angle that the arm was sticking out at uh, in an attempt to make it not look dislocated, but I think I, I still ended up with it being a tiny bit dislocated, and I think that really has to do with more of the placement of the shoulder, but in any case, I thought this was a really nice example. Tip number two, breaking things down into basic shapes. And I know this is something that you've heard in every single art class that you've ever taken since you're a little kid, but this is still something I revisit just because it's challenging to do for, um, for basically like, as an artist, you're training your brain to break down any object you see into basic shapes. So doing that for like every object in existence that you could ever want to draw is is challenging and it's something that I always find myself going back to, especially with organic things like people and animals and plants. These are all super, super complex shapes. And so you're always wanting to go back to what is the basic shape that I know how to draw that makes up this more complex shape. Draw that first to figure out again how these forms fill up the 3D space and then start breaking that down into the more complex shapes. It's like if you've ever done 3D modeling, you always start out by making, you know, these really basic, like a ball shape maybe is going to become leaves in a tree. So you put like a ball on top of a log and then you start carving out the different leaves and the different branches and you always start with a basic shape and then start carving it down into the more complex object. You kind of do the same thing with sketching. You start with your spheres and your boxes and then you start shaving off material essentially until you come down to the shape of the complex object that you're going for, right? It's, it's also kind of like where somebody takes a bunch of words in a sentence and they jumble up a bunch of the letters, but you can still read it. It's because your brain is perceiving those basic shapes and is still able to figure out what the object is from that. So if you're really good about taking complex objects and turning them into basic shapes, you should be able to tell what the final thing is, even while it's like very blocky, I guess, in, in its first stages. So I tried to find a standing figure for this one that had some pretty good shapes that I could break this down into. For breaking things down into basic shapes, especially for figure drawings, there are so many different schools of thought on how to do this. Some people are like, to use boxes and break down the body into boxes and some people are like don't use sharp corners because organic things aren't made out of like straight lines and sharp corners so use curvy things like ovals um and some people are like don't use ovals that's that's dumb use triangles break down the body into triangles because that's the best i think it's just a matter of trying different things and finding what works for you and for how you perceive objects that you're drawing. I think there's no one right way to do it. There's just a lot of different ways that work for a lot of different people. So really just try everything out and then just stick to the one that works for you. So the way that I like to break down the body, basically based on the first way that I ever was taught to draw people. So that involves doing a little oval for the head, trapezoid, for upper body and sort of a bell for the hips. And then I like to kind of do the boxy thing and sort of start to understand where the rib cage is. And then this, the hips will be, become kind of a log. And then I'll just have the legs sort of pop out from the sides of the log. And I like to draw little circles where the hips, where the knees, um, where the elbows are and the hands will become a little like triangular thing, I guess, and the feet as well. So that's the way that I like to break down the figure. Um, and then, you know, I'll do the neck and maybe some sort of approximation of where I think the spine is. And then I start to build out the, the shapes of the body on top of that, the more accurate shapes of what it should be. So I did a little sketch of how I broke down this body into boxy objects uh, when I was first drawing it. Um, and I was 
again, this person is sort of walking, so I was sort of trying to pay attention to where the weight was in the body, which foot she was leaning on, and how this leg is swinging, because there's no weight in this hip, so that's just kind of a loose swinging joint, and you can see that all the weight is going into this foot. Those are just things that I tried to pay attention to when I was laying out the basic shapes. I also was looking at the, the direction that her chest was facing and then that there was sort of a twist in the hips, just so that when I was laying down this basic foundation, um, I had something that captured the, the kind of weight and the flow of the figure before I started building on more layers of detail. I thought it would be fun to do a sort of foreshortened figure that kind of put together a bunch of these things. And I'll also talk about the next tip while we're looking at this figure. So we have broken down the figure into its basic boxy shapes. You can see the basic boxy shapes here. They're a little awkward and wonky because the ankle was awkward and wonky and I was trying to wrap my brain around how to actually draw it. Once I did the slightly more detailed figure on top, looking at the negative spaces between the arms and the hips here was so mind-blowing for me. This arm in the back, I had it going so much further down originally uh, before I realized that none of the upper part of the arm is at all touching this negative space. The entire thing is just like almost completely hidden from view uh, behind the shoulder. And it's only just a tiny bit of the forearm um, next to the hip and actually the top of the thigh that is creating that shape. So that was like mind-blowing and realizing how much was actually foreshortened on this side of the body. And then on this side as well, there's quite a bit of foreshortening on the upper part of the arm and then her arms are just bent so you're able to see more of the forearm and that's most of what's creating the shape even on the her right side of the body as well. And then the other thing that was mind blowing to me is it's actually the top of the calf that is closing the bottom of the shape. And most of this bottom part as well is just being created by the hip. <laughs> you don't see much of the chest at all. It's again almost completely foreshortened away all the like upper parts of the body. So that was quite fun and helped a lot in reducing the <laughs> overall wonkiness of this. And I circled the, oh yeah, the um, the forearm and the, the chest on the left side of the body. Figuring out where those are placed as well as the hand being over the calf on the right side of the body. Thanks to placing all of those other elements around the negative space objects, I realized that the, the hand and the calf were like from the 2D perspective, they're like touching basically. You know, if you're to look at this person from the front, they wouldn't be touching, but from this angle, they are essentially touching. And I like almost totally miss that uh, without looking at the negative space. So the next tip that is certainly the most fun <laughs> is flipping the canvas. And I'm sure, again, this is one that you've heard before, but I think a lot of people maybe don't understand what that is doing. And it's basically allowing you to look at your drawing with completely new eyes. Like that's a difficult thing that you're always trying to do when you're trying to draw better and better is you're training your eye to see the mistakes that you didn't know how to see previously. Well, when you flip the canvas, that is your kind of like free way to get a new pair of eyes and to allow yourself to see all the mistakes that your regular eyes don't see. So these first three examples that I drew, I didn't bother flipping the canvas. So um, let's try flipping the canvas and see how I did on all three of these. So let's go to canvas and then flip horizontal. Um, yeah, it's like this. It's a little bit wonky, I think. Like, I think she's a little, somehow it feels like it's a little bit squished on this side. Like this shoulder is a little bit too skinny, I think. Or at least that's the way that it feels to my eyes. And then this leg, to my eyes, looks a little bit broken. And I think that's something that I would have seen if I had just flipped the canvas earlier. And then I think I would have been able to align these hips and the waist in a little bit of a less awkward way. So that's fun. Let's look at this one. Let's see how this one looks backwards. Um, yeah, so it is immediately clear to me that this, this shoulder is like way too far inward and it looks dislocated. And that would have been way clearer if I had done that earlier in the sketch. Thanks for ending your eyes. Let's see, and this one... I mean, it's, it's not too bad, is it? I don't know, let me know what you think. This, this one was a weird pose to begin with. Um, 
I think this person. Oh wait, which way was it? Yeah. Oh, I drew it this way, so it feels weird that you can't see this other arm, this other back arm at all. Alright, so this next tip is something that I learned a little more recently and I think it's something that I knew and I think a lot of people know subconsciously, but it hadn't ever been like explicitly consciously explained to me as something that you can take advantage of in your art, and that is doing less detail in shadow. So again, I tried to do an example for this one and it came out like kind of medium. Basically, when there's a lot of light on an object, then, you know, that brings out a bunch of detail. So in the well-lit places, you know, unless you're trying to emulate like a well, camera, like blown out sort of effect where detail is lost. Most of the time, looking at something that is under harsh sunlight, you're going to be able to see tons of detail. Like for a human face, you're going to see every pore on that face. When there are parts of an object that are in shadow, you're not going to be able to perceive as much detail. You think that you perceive detail because your brain, due to pattern recognition, is filling in what detail it thinks is there. So because of that, we tend to draw as much detail in the shadow, or we tend to want to draw as much detail in the shadow as we do in the light side because we think, we're, we're thinking in terms of what we know is there rather than what you can actually see based on the amount of light that is present. So hopefully that made some sense. I tried to do an example and this example is a little bit wonky because there were like three light sources of these different neon colors. There was this blue at the bottom and then this bright strong yellow light and then a little bit of red light on this side. I, I really love using those like cool neon lit portraits as reference. Well, I learned something about this camera. It records for 30 minutes and then it stops. So I'm gonna have to redo the last part of this video. Third time's the charm, am I right? All right. So as I was saying, the amount of detail that you actually perceive is determined by how much light is present on the environment and how much light is being shined on the part of the object that you're drawing. You can't see as much detail in the shadowy parts unless there's a lot of reflected light in which it's not only really in shadow, it's also lit but you don't actually perceive as much detail in the shadowy parts um, as you do in the light parts, but your brain thinks that it does, and it fills in the details that it knows about the shadowy part uh, based on um, the context from the environment and the shape of the shadow and so on. Your job as an artist is to draw in all those context clues so that the brain can fill in those details, and when you've done that well, you actually don't need to provide any of that detail in the shadowy part yourself which is like really cool and really satisfying to do when you can just draw like a big wonky shape, fill it in with a darker color and be done. And you know, you realize that your brain is naturally filling in all the things that you didn't have to spend time drawing. And that's just really cool. So where I tried to use this as an example was basically around the middle section of the face here. The only shapes I really had to draw were like the white of the eye, the reflection of the eye, the shape on the eyelid, the nose and the cheek. And then the rest of this, I pretty much just tried to fill in with shadow. I did, of course, add a little bit of darker shadow around where the eyebrow is and underneath the eye just to create the impression of the eye socket. And the rest, I just tried to just fill in as a shadow. And so anything like the shape of the bridge of the nose, the curve of the cheek here, or the curve of the eyelid there are all details that would just be filled in naturally by your brain, um, as well as maybe any shape of any curvature that is here on the cheek. And then of course the same goes for the lips here, right? All we have is the shape of the outside and this little curve in here. And then the rest, maybe like the separation between the ribs here and here, or the shape, the curve of it on this side is basically just determined by what curve I drew on the outside here, and then your brain is just interpreting that the rest of the lip is just as full. The other place I, I guess I did this a bit was just doing the shape of the eye here. I kind of did the same thing where I only filled in the highlight of the white of the eye and the, the kind of reflection of the light on the opposite side um, in the iris. And then the rest of this here, I just filled in with a dark shadow. So that's how I tried to use this drawing as an example. I hope that made some sense. And with that, we'll move on to the last tip, which is that shadows are not gray. Don't draw your shadows gray. In the vast majority of situations, shadows are reflecting the other colors that are in the environment. So I thought I would pull some examples from some movies to show you an example of this. And I don't know if 
you love drawing from movies as much as I do, but I really like drawing from movies and using their color palettes. Just, yeah, I have, I have a whole Pinterest board of color palettes just like this. So this one I thought would be extra interesting to look at. Um, I think this movie is called The Witch or Witch or something like that. It's an interesting, very artsy one. So this movie was intentionally sort of filtered with this very gray cast. So I thought it would be extra interesting to see what sorts of colors the, the shadows picked up in this because it was intentionally made so like dark and depressing and dingy. Um, so maybe just sampling her like whitish, a shadow from this whitish uh, thing that she's wearing. It's actually like a moderately saturated blue color. And then maybe a shadow from her neck here is, and it's pretty close to gray actually, but it's a little bit green and that's why the rest of this um, has gone to the, the green part of the slider. So I think there's sort of like a blue green cast on this. Um, yeah, even the background is like kind of a between blue and green. Um, the shadow on her hair is, I mean, it's blonde hair, so it's a little bit more on the yellow side. Um, shadow behind her hands is, again, it's, it's a blue, but it's not totally gray. It's like a little tiny bit saturated. So yeah, even in this like super sort of dingy gray, that one is pretty much just gray black, but even in this sort of very dingy gray atmosphere, these shadows for the most part, they're all some other color with like, with a little bit of saturation in the blue or the green side. This other example that I pulled, this is not one that's like super saturated. It definitely has some kind of cast, some kind of filter over it to create some kind of atmosphere on it. But so let's see, the color of her skin is it's kind of this like dull pinkish color and then when you go into the shadow it's it actually became a little bit more saturated um and purple you see it's like barely saturated at all at all in the lighter part of the skin and then as you go to the darker part it becomes more saturated as as it becomes darker um and kind of more purple i feel like it's kind of a purple blue cast on here so maybe let's look at the lighter part of her shirt is this very vivid blue. Well, not, not vivid, but it's a more saturated blue than the skin. As you go into the shadow, it becomes way more saturated. So let's actually look at this darker part. So first let me sample the lighter part on her collarbone. It's kind of a gray. Um, so then as we go into the shadow here, it becomes a pretty saturated purple in that really dark part underneath the collarbone. Let's maybe look at the hair. The hair is also a blue color, just like a gray blue in that shadow. As we go into the really dark part here, that is like almost black, but the saturation slider is all the way to the top. So that's like one of the most really saturated colors. Yeah, it looks like it's all kind of like purples and pinks in the shadows, but they're really saturated colors. Of course, some of this might be just now, obviously this image has gone through a lot of different compression algorithms and I'm sure that has impacted the value of these pixels some, but regardless, I think this is a pretty good example of showing how saturated shadows typically are. And I think this is also something that's a really great tool when you're trying to create a painting that has a certain feeling and a certain atmosphere to it. You can create a lot of that by choosing what color all of your shadows are leaning towards. I'll create a really strong sense of what kind of color cast and what kind of mood and what kind of feeling there is um, on the colored artwork or painting or whatever it is that you're creating. So this is something that I love taking advantage of when I'm trying to build a color scheme and when I'm trying to build an atmosphere in my drawings. Hopefully that recorded this time. All right, so that is my five top favorite art tips right now. I'm sure if you ask me a year from now what my top favorite art tips are, um, it'll be a different story. But like I said, these are all things that I do find myself returning to time and time again when I want to rebuild my foundational skills and just keep refining my art and taking it to the next level. Let me know if these tips were helpful for you and if you've heard of them before or if they've been explained to you in this way or if they've been explained to you in a different way that you found more helpful than my explanations of it, I would love to learn from you. So leave me a comment down below and I look forward to hearing from you and learning from you. Thank you very much for stopping by. Thanks for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Oh, my screen recording died. Good. Oh, hello.
Calm down. Speakers are okay.